Welcome back to the core. We're talking about language learning now here in Human Relations and World Missions. And in our last session, we saw that there are two basic parts or elements of language learning when it comes to us as missionaries. One is the gift of God and one is the will to learn. And if you can have a, a balance of both of those things, then you will learn languages. The gift of God, of course, is what God did in the book of Acts when supernaturally people were able to speak in languages and those that were from all the nations could understand the Galileans speaking in their languages. So that was a gift given supernaturally by God, enabling them to speak things. So I believe there is a supernatural element. And we know that the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, 10 speak about tongues and diversity of tongues and interpretation of tongues. So that's all just languages. So the gifting, the gift of the Spirit does involve what technically would be languages and different kinds of languages and the ability to interpret languages. Now we know that there's a supernatural utter utterance and you do not always know what you're saying according to Paul's writings concerning praying in tongues. But you and I pray in tongues, but there are times the Lord can use it supernaturally, but it also can be used, as I said, to help you form certain sounds, like the guttural sounds, the trilled R. And I told you about how God challenged me and I was able to study a book and learn it in a short period of time. And that book I was able to, one week later, go into Indonesia speaking the language, all because of what is now I'm talking about, the second part, the will to learn, motivated by a desire to preach the gospel to people by a desire to bring the good news of Jesus to them because they had never heard. And how were they here without a preacher? Well, how would he preach if he's not able to speak the language in, in which the people are living? So that motivation is upon us. And there are many people who desire to speak languages, but not everyone wants to learn to speak the language. The learning part, the diligence, the focus, the hard work. And we need help with that. But the Spirit of the Lord will come upon us. And another story, testimony I have was when I was preparing to go to India. A lot of times when you're responding to a call of God, you're not, you're not perfectly sure. Uh, there's not absolute certainty of call. You're walking blindly by faith, wondering if you should. In fact, that's what we see in the book of Acts in the 16th chapter where they were debating whether or not they should go into Asia. The Spirit of the Lord did not allow them. Then they went to, by way of Mysia and Bithynia, but uh, there they were not allowed to do that either. And so two times they tried to do something. It wasn't, they were trying to figure out, this is the Apostle Paul with Luke. They were trying to figure out where they should go. And then finally they had a dream about a man in Macedonia and it says, and they concluded that they should go there. And it's funny because that word concluded means that they guessed. It means that they were like, I, I guess that's what we're supposed to do. So often the will of the Lord is like that. And when I was getting ready to go to India, as yes, the Lord spoke to me, but once again, clarity of voices with hindsight. Then I was like, I hope this is God. Let me just obey these feelings I have. And I needed some confirmations. So I went online and researched India and I found out that one of the most commonly spoken languages there outside of English is the first language that binds, but many people do not speak English at all there. I found out that Hindi was the most commonly spoken language outside. In, in, in many realms, they spoke Hindi as a second language if their mother tongue was in fact a different language. So a lot of people that speak Marathi can also speak basic Hindi etc. So I did a research and I found a course on reading and writing Hindi at Cambridge at the Cambridge University that they were offering a free course for a, it's like a like a 20 week series on being able to read and write in their script and their script is not like English script it is very different see in Sp I'd never had to to confront this because in when I learned Spanish, Spanish uses Roman letters. So our numbers and letters are the same, Arabic numbers and Roman letters, which are the ABC as we see it. The only difference is one of them had a little squiggly line over it, which is the ñ, and occasionally accents were used, that's it. 
So that was easy. The rest was about the sounds of language, but when it came to this new language, it's not written in English form like ours. It's not written with Roman letters, so you have to learn a whole new alphabet. And it's not just uh, a few letters. There are 85 characters, plus all of the superscripts and subscripts of vowel marks. And so it was quite an elaborate phonetic language system. And so I thought, wow, that would... And people said, as I read more online, they said that actually a lot of people could learn to speak Hindi, but not read and write it. But I was curious. So I downloaded this course and I printed out on my printer in my office in Mexico. This is like in 1998-99. And after it was printed, I opened it up and I began to study it. And I thought, this is interesting. And it explained that the language is broken up. The alphabet is structured according to origins of sounds that the first level is from inside your throat, guttural sounds. And then the next level is coming from the back of your tongue. Then the next level is coming from the roof of your mouth, your, your palate. Then the next is coming from the before your teeth, and then on your teeth, and then your lips and tongue. So different origins were the layers of each one. So categorically, it seemed like, okay, I think I can learn this interesting. It's a 20-week course. Let me just look into it. So after I downloaded, I started standing there by the printer. I just felt this heat come over me where I studied the first character, the second character, and then before you know it, I had the first line of characters and could write them, and I was practicing on this paper, and I had them memorized. Went to the next line. Now, I standing in my office for like four hours, don't know what come over me. I just was fascinated. Then I realized, well, I might as well sit down. And I sat down and studied another 12 hours. Then I went to sleep exhausted. And about two hours after I went to sleep, I woke up again with that heat upon me, this desire. So I got up again and started my study. And I learned the next level and the next level. I studied all that next day. One day after another in about three days. In three days, I went through all of the teachings and I could reproduce and write anything in Hindi. And without looking, I could write phonetically. And because it's a phonetic language, I could write English in Hindi in the Devnagri and could read it because of the phonetic sound of it. And then I was able to start learning words connected to it. By the time I went to India the first time, I could read all the signs, anything written in Hindi or using those characters, I could read and pronounce them, which was a great shock to my taxi cab driver and other people. And they were wondering, how did you learn that? And they even said, not many people learn that part first, but I did. And it was a sign and a wonder to me that I could write it fluent. And I still can to this day, I can write in Hindi, or not actually in Hindi, I can write in English using the the um, Sanskrit or the Devnagri. I can write it all out. So when I want to take secret notes, I can do it in, in Hindi script, although it is English writing. So it was a sign and a wonder to me that God was saying, yes, you're supposed to go to India. So I went and I obeyed the Lord for as long as he had me there to do what I had to do until he called me to go to the next place and then the next place and the next place. But each and every nation I've been through, there's been a supernatural help to learn and connect to languages and grow as a sign. But you have to be willing to do it. You have to be willing to pay that price. And one of the most costly aspects of language learning is, of course, uh, your pride, and as I said, they'll be mocking you, they'll be making fun of you. And I want to talk a little bit about how to learn languages. So with the two ingredients, the gift of God and the will to learn together, then we're going to look at five steps to dominating a language. Everything starts with, for me, the vowels. Concentrate on the vowels first. For instance, in the Spanish language, which I've I've taught many missionaries to speak Spanish. The vowels, in Spanish there's only five vowels. It's A, E, I, O, U. Now those five vowels never, ever, 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 ever change. Which is difficult for us as English speakers because we have other phonetic sounds. English language has 44 phonetic variations. 
you're thinking, what? We only have five vowels too. Yeah, but how we pronounce it and combinations of them changes. We say o, 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 a, o, u, 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 u. In other words, each of those, like there's a whole range they've identified as 44 sounds. If I say distraught, aw, aw. If I say out, aw, aw, that the vowel sounds there. Spanish doesn't have that. Spanish was simply five of them. And the reason why people mispronounce the Spanish language learning from English is because they are using some of those 44 different sounds instead of only five. We also have the five in our language and they do exist like ah, ah, very simply like when the doctor wants to see inside your throat and he says, uh, stick out your tongue and say ah, ah. So that's the letter A, but it will never not be ah. So for the word for house, it's ca, sa, a, a, casa, casa. It's, so it's not casa. So as soon as you go to a, for that A, you've mutilated the word and nobody's going to understand what you're saying and you have a terrible accent. All you need to do is learn how to always say ah, 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 ah. Same with A, same with the letter E. It's A, like you are saying, hey, how are you? Or I, I, I got an A on my report card. Or A, it's like A, like as in say, say the truth. A, 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 A. Never changes always exactly the same. It's never going to be eh. Eh is not in the Spanish. There is no eh in Spanish. It's always a. Eh. So it's a, ah, eh, 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 eh. So learn the vowel first. The letter I. It is always e. A, ah, e, eh, e, 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 as in two e's, like in sleep. E always never changes unless you mess it up. If you start to go to eh, then. Ernero, uh, like for instance, if you want to say, um, uh, if it's in the middle of the word or the beginning of the word, Ernesto, for instance, Ernest, the person who is Ernest, er, 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 it's not Ernest, Ernesto is wrong. Simply put, five vowels, you learn them right the first time. And I used to have my students go through drills of, we would spend a week just mastering the five vowels. And once you have that, Anything you read off of a paper, you would pronounce it correctly. You couldn't mispronounce words because the mispronunciation of words in Spanish has to do with the variations of the five vowels. If you can stick to the five so forms in which they're pronounced and only do that, then you will always have the right pronunciation of those words. The rest of this has to do with accentuation of the syllables. So the, learn the vowels. Indonesian was exactly the same. The only difference in Indonesian is the, the letter E, the second vowel, has two different forms of pronunciation. It can be a, uh, like a short U, or it can be A. So I had to learn how to um, pronounce that differently but depending on, and like it's not, there's a word for first, is pertama. The a, a is the same, A is identical in Spanish, so tama is easy, per, per, P E R. And the, r, the R's are trilled just like Spanish, so it was an easy transition for me. Which points out another thing about languages. With every language you learn, the next language is exponentially easier to learn. By the time you get on your fourth or your fifth language, you can start learning languages in a much shorter period of time. And so you should have a vision, everybody could have a vision to be a linguist and learn multiple languages. I highly recommend it. It's such a, uh, it's such a joy to be able to speak an, another language besides your language. And it's not difficult if you focus. And of course, I'm always willing to help missionaries learn language. I could spend the rest, of, I, have a, I have a degree in language arts from, uh, from a university in, in Mexico where I learned and that's one of the reasons I, my I have an actual diploma in linguistics. And, but concerning Spanish language, I have what would be the equivalent of a master's in the language. Is I, I, there's nothing I don't know. It's a beautiful language, and I love speaking it. But Bahasa, 
uh, is also very easy to learn because the vowels are the same. The second thing we see there after you learn those vowels is of course master the consonant sounds. Those are much easier because they're so much like English consonants. They always will have, basically you're just going to have the k and the g sound and the l and the m, which is once again phonetically by their origins and you have guttural words and lip or labials like mom, n, 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 is the N is on your palate. So you learn all these consonants. Number three, endlessly study. You just cannot stop studying. Let it be what you do all the time. When I was learning Spanish, I always had my books with me and I drove a van for a while, which I've told you, and I had the privilege of being able to just sit in the van and protect it and study language. And it was in that van one night through the night that I broke my all-time record for most, most vocabulary learned in one day. And I learned 200 vocabulary words in one day with complete retention. In other words, I learned all 200 words without missing any of them. And by the next day, I knew all of them. I was adding to my vocabulary so quickly by the system that I figured out. And it was a, an interesting system. I'd like to explain it to you a little bit because it's very helpful. It has to do with pictures. And later when we talk about culture shock, I'm going to discuss with you why we go into culture shock. And it's because our pictures do not match the words that describe those pictures. But we all see first things, provided that we can see, of course. We all see things and we learn by visualization much quicker than we do by repetition. In other words, we learn by association. So I'll give you the secret to learning multiple words. You have to, let me give you the analogy of a computer. Most of us know enough about computers to know that there are two kinds of memory in a computer. You have the short-term memory, which is the RAM, and you know within that RAM, if you don't save something to disk, save a file, that it will be lost when you, if the computer like shuts off, it's happened to us all. Happened to us all, We've had, we're working on some document and the computer ran out of battery or it, the power went out if it was like a regular PC and what happened? Whatever you hadn't written to disk or saved is gone because it was in the, the short-term memory, the RAM, not the ROM or written actually on a disk. So it is with us as human beings. We're very much like computers in the sense that we have short-term memory and long-term memory. Long-term memory for us are archived images and sounds, pronunciation of words, locked into our brains that we have learned our whole life. Our short-term memory is for quick memorization. For instance, have you ever gotten a message on your phone that gives you a code number, one-time password, usually four digits, right? Not hard, right? It might say 3662, 3662. So what do you do? You just keep repeating it, 3662, 3662, and then you go to the other app and you type it in and it works. But if I ask you one hour later, what was that number? You won't remember it. Why is that? Because it just disappears. And by then you put other things. They, and in fact, technically they say you can only fit seven digits in the short-term memory. And with every next digit, you push the first digit in the line off. So it's meant, it only helps you learn bits. So when you're studying, this is a big mistake people make when it comes to learning languages. When they're studying, they're using so much of their short-term memory that they lose most of that information by the time their study session ends. Why? Because they didn't save it to disk. So that when you go to sleep, and wake up, it's the same as turning the computer off and back on. You wake up and that stuff is gone. Why? Because you did not permanently remember it. You say, well, how do you permanently remember it? Well, you have to write it to disk. Now, in the analogy, this is the way I see it. Writing to disk means that you connect this new word that you're learning, this new thing, you connect it to a long-term memory that's already there. You add it to a file that already exists. 
And you say, how do you do that? Well, you think about the word you're learning, which is foreign to you because it's a new word, right? That's why you have to learn it. What does it sound like to you? What does it look like? And I'll give you an example. For instance, when I was learning the colors for in the language Bahasa, which Bahasa just means language in Indonesian, but Bahasa Indonesia is the language of Indonesia. When I was learning that language, I was studying the colors and they are such different words. They don't sound anything. I'll give you an easy one was very easy. Their color for brown is chocolate. Chocolate, just like it's, it's like you're saying chocolate. So that's easy. Sometimes you luck out, right? That sometimes you're blessed that the words are sound so much like an English word, like in Spanish when you learn construcción. Obviously, it's construction, things like that. That's easy. But many other words are completely different. Not at all like your word for, for instance, the color black. If I say black, like my shirt. And black is black, but in other languages, it's not. So in Spanish, the word for black is negro. Well, that was an easy one. I'm not going to go into why, because it might, I might end up sounding racist if I do. Pretty easy to remember that one. But in Bahasa, the word is hitam. Hitam, H-I-T-A-M, hitam. So how would I memorize black? Hitam. I have to connect that new word that's never existed in my vocabulary, hitam. I have to make it look like black in my mind. So how do you do that? Well, it's easy. If a robber, a bad man comes who is like a cat burglar, they wear black and they may have like the black ski mask on, right? So if they wear black and they're coming to attack you, you need to hit him. Hit him real quick before he gets your stuff. Hit him. See, hit him, if you say it like hit him, it sounds like what you do when the thief comes. So you see in your mind, you create this picture, this man wearing black is coming after you to rob you, and you hit him. Hit him. Hit him hard. Hit him. Hit him. Now it's stuck in my head. And if you just did that visualization with me, you will now remember the word for black. What's the word for black in Indonesian? Not hit him, but hitam. See, it has to be close enough, but doesn't have to be identical. Something to connect now. The new word hitam is connected to, everybody has a cat burglar image of some time or a thief that has a black ski mask on or something in their mind. So you just tie it to that. Let me go to another word and show you how this works. How about the word for white? Well, the word for white in Indonesian is puti. Puti. P-U-T-I-H. Puti. So, what does it sound like? Well, it sounds to me like, like puti. <laughs> like, like baby poo poo. Puti. Little, make a little puti. Well, where does the baby make a little puti? It makes it in a diaper. And what color traditionally is a diaper? white. So white diaper. And I, when I'm doing this, I'm picturing in my mind a little baby, the white diaper, and the baby's looking at me, pointing at its stinky butt and going, putty, putty, like there's putty in there. So it's stuck in my head. You see it in your mind? So now you know putty is white. And remember black? Here comes the guy. What do you do to him? Right. Hit them. So we got black and white. Now, go on and on. I had to learn the word yellow. I'm going to give you a few so you can see how this works. So by the way, if you do this with me, you will have learned colors in Indonesian and never be able to forget them because you've written them to your long-term memory. The word for yellow is kuning. Okay. Well, I created an image in my mind that showed me going hunting for raccoons. I'm going cooning. And when I go cooning, it's raining. So I put on a yellow raincoat because when I was a boy, all of our raincoats were yellow and they still are. And so I'm going cooning, hunting raccoons. And I have my 
yellow raincoat on. So now yellow connected to me hunting raccoons and I visualize myself with a gun aiming. You see the yellow raincoat top and I see in the tree the raccoon hiding. I'm cooning. Cooning is yellow. So what was white again? See the baby pointing at his rear end? At his what? At his diaper. What color is the diaper? It's white. So Pudi got it already. What's the black? Gita. Now what is yellow? Cooning. Right. Cooning. You got it. Just like that. One after another after another. You can keep adding words like that. It can get, it doesn't have to just be colors, of course. I remember when I learned all the utensils. By the way, this is another hint. When you're learning a, a grouping of words, try to connect them all together in a circle. I had a wonderful dictionary years ago for the Spanish language when I was learning it, which was the um, Ogden Duden Press um, Cambridge Dictionary of, of pictor pictorial dictionary. There was, it showed a picture, a diagram of like a doctor's office with about 90 things with little numbers and at the bottom you could name each one by visualization. Very helpful. And so it is when I was learning the words for eating utensils, a fork and a spoon and a knife and a plate and a cup and a glass and a table and chair. See, picture an entire world and go through it in your mind building the images and create a story in your mind that leads you to remember these words. It's very helpful. And this is the way I've learned. That's why I was able to learn 200 vocabulary words in one day and memorize them all through this succession. That's also how I was able to memorize every single train station in Singapore before I ever came here, I knew the entire train route, every station by heart. It's like, why would you want to know that? Well, because when you use this form of mind palaces, they're called, when you construct these mind palaces for memorization, it makes you feel more comfortable in a, a land like this because now I've memorized the whole train station. So if I'm in Ang Mo Kyo, I know which direction to go on the train to go to either place. If you tell me, well, you need to get to Khatib, okay, I can do that. I can easily find it on a map, but I already have the map in my mind. I did that while I was living in India. I memorized the train system of Singapore by using this same method. Of course, you can apply it to many different realms. You can also apply it to Bible learning, etc. But for language, it's extremely helpful. Write it to disc. Stop punishing yourself. You can get it by repetition, but the repetition inevitably will make you write it to disc, but you can cheat the process without repetition and learn things very, very quickly. And of course, I can teach you that further in the future to help you. But that's endlessly study, but study smart. Speak to the people, number four. Yeah, you have to spend time speaking to the people. The more you're talking with them, the more you're able to learn. Number five, uh, sing the song of the land. Now, this is interesting because it so happens that languages are sung as a song. They're not just mechanically spoken. And for instance, I'm going to, what if you just took the way I'm talking to you right now, I'm actually singing a song. So if I just remove the words and continue to make the tones that my voice is using right now, you understand, there's a song. If you go to a land and you do not know the language and close your ears and listen to the muffled tones of the language, you will hear a song and the song changes in any language in different places. So if you listen, you may hear it the way that it flows. And this works also for mastering dialects or accents. For instance, in the Spanish language. In Spanish, when I first learned the language, I learned it in the north and that was what I told you was kind of the speedy Gonzales uh, language sound. 
which is the, you know, Riva, Riva, Andale. So that, that was the Speedy Gonzales language sound was this certain tones. And if you hear the song, it's like, da 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 Da, like almost like that song like la cucaracha it kind of rides that tone so if i want to go to the store to buy a coca cola quiero ir a la tienda para comprar una coca now that tone sound is the song because if i take the words away in spanish in the north and just listen to people in the small towns of the north i hear <laughs> it's, a, it's a musical town, town, um, tone that I hear. So when I learn the language, I start singing it in the song, and suddenly people understand me. If I don't sing it according to the rules of the song, people will say, you're a foreigner. We don't know. No matter how fluent you become, if you don't know the song, they will say you don't belong. It's just that simple. You've got to find the tone. And of course, it changes. I can say, quiero ir, a, quiero ir a la tienda para comprar una coca. Like, that's in the north. You know, if I go to the south, it becomes quite opposite. It's quiero ir a la tienda para comprar una coca. It goes down on the end. Uh, it could be variations. Quiero ir a la tienda para comprar una coca. It sounds more... Like Guadalajara, it sounds more like Italian almost because the song changes. It's the same in English. If, if you're from Texas, you talk more like this, a foghorn leghorn. Remember the, the, the cartoon? That's a song of Texas. If you're from New Orleans, it's, you know, my mom and them, what they got in the icebox, they dole, and, you know, you start getting into the tonality of that land and that place. So very important that you sing the song of the language in the land and of course this is varying from language to language and uh, I would I love language and I love teaching language and more importantly I love learning language now the level of concentration that you invest in the language corresponds with the level of success that you will enjoy the more you put it into it the more you get out of it and but study but study smart as I say when you realize that one of the only things that stand between you and the people who need Jesus is your ignorance, and you will dedicate yourself to learning the language. This is an absolute fact. Okay, now I recommend that the missionaries spend at least the first year concentrating entirely on the language and culture learning before preaching the gospel. And the reason for this is because if you go in and immediately try to express eternal values in a language you're not familiar with, you can inadvertently say the wrong things, you misuse words, and, and you're still in the first year or two. Honestly, technically, and I'm, I'm a bit of, I'm a bit of um, an extremist about learning, and I learn quickly, so don't use me as the only standard. I think everyone can be me because I know me and I'm not smart, and I just use some principles that help me. But the average to fluency is five years. And I know you're thinking that's a long time. Your first language, it's five years to fluency. Your second language will be about three to three and a half years. Your third language, usually about two and a half to three years fluency. As I say, each language you learn, the learning time shortens. And you get better and better. And you can be a linguist of many, many different languages. In fact, I've heard a fascinating story of a man that worked for the UN years ago that spoke spoke 40 plus languages. I think he spoke 42 languages. I'm not particularly sure, but a lot. One of the most lingual people on the earth. And what was fascinating was that although he mastered all of these languages, he could not speak all of them fluently at one given season of his life. You understand? He had the knowledge of all the languages, but he could only keep about six or seven of the languages actively fluent at a given time. So when he was given certain assignments by the UN, all he needed to do is go into his laboratory and revive 
the language that he was going to need. And it would just take him about a month or so to get it back into perfect fluency. Then he would use it. But when he would do it, one of his other languages would fall out of fluency. So he was an interesting example of someone that was, was showing us the, the limits to the human capacity to learn languages. Now, this is another fascinating thing about language learning. And I found this to be completely true. Different languages will alter your personality. If you learn the languages properly, you are going to become a different person in each of the languages you learn. For instance, English me is one thing, and it has a lot to do with my roots in the United States of America. I'm hopelessly American, of course, but I'm not your typical American because I'm international. My English is what it is because of my existence, but it is a personality. However, my Spanish personality is quite different. I'll give you an example. In Spanish, I'm what they call muy bromista, which means I am kind of a joker. Now, in English, I am not. I, I, I can be humorous, but I'm not a joker. I'm not doing practical funny things or practical jokes in English. In fact, I did test them. But something happens in my, my Spanish I'm very funny all the time making silly jokes, and I love jokes. And it's one of the ways that I speak Spanish. In fact, I was always doing something funny, and that's why they would call me, my name is Esteban in Spanish, but they would call me I Esteban all the time. So, I Esteban, which is like, oh, Stephen. It, that was pretty much my name in Spanish, and still is. You, you crazy, you, you, cra like always they're saying, estás loco, no me digas, like, like they're laughing at me because I tell jokes all the time. And that's my personality in Spanish. I'm a different person. Now this, this, this gets pretty deep because you will start to make decisions differently in different languages. You can be given the same set of circumstances. But your conclusions, if you're speaking Spanish when you're presented with these opportunities, you will come up with different conclusions than if you're speaking English. Now, I know that's hard for you to understand, but this is because in your mind, you are different. You think different, you act different. Because when you learn that language, you were living certain circumstances which tempered that part of you. And when you learn another language, same thing. It tempers the part of you that you become almost, it's almost like a controlled form of schizophrenia. You know, schizophrenia is multiple personalities. I would say I have multiple personalities linguistically. And that Stephen, Esteban is not the same as Stephen. Stephen's one guy, you know him as I teach the core. Esteban, if I were teaching in Spanish, you'd see a very different me. And if you've been around me long enough to see me relate to people who speak Spanish, you'll see I act differently while I'm speaking it because the language needs different hand gestures and different ways that you move. This is especially true with Hindi, for instance. When you're speaking Hindi, the yes and no, the language differences have a lot to do with your body. So if you agree with something, you will do this with your head, which almost looks like you're saying no. But it means yes, 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 no problem, no problem, I will do, yes, yes, of course, of course. So even when you're speaking English, like I learned Indian English to communicate commonly with people and did not stick just to my American English, because if I were speaking my American English, it wouldn't be, mis it wouldn't be understood all the time. So um, you say things that are kind of transliterated Hindi into English. Like, how much? This one, how much? Well, we don't say in English, this one, how much? That just seems rude, but in Hindi you do. And you, you bark out single commands in Hindi too, which are also, the Hindi speaking me has a lower brow. I'm more abrupt and almost angry, more determined and straightforward. I say, do this, do that, no, yes, no, you know, I, I, this is part of the personality in Hindi. So it varies. And of course, the way you move when you speak it.
it will be different. And it's all part of the, that, in other words, it's a different you in that time. And so it is with Bahasa, same thing. And then when I'm learning Bahasa and speaking Bahasa, I will relate differently as well. And so it's, it's a fun part of language learning that you will come to find out there are many different parts of you. Now we go back to the book and I want to talk about the subject of culture shock and more specifically how to avoid it. The definition of culture shock. Hmm. Okay. Hang on with me here. Let's read. When we are born, we begin to experience the world around us through our five natural senses, right? Sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. These senses are used to form a mental catalog of images matched with vocabulary of words. In other words, what you see connected to a pronunciation of a word. You see, for instance, light. You look at a lamp or a light. Light, the word light. Oh, that's bright. Bright, light. And, and when you look at the bright light straight at it, you, you, those words are there in your mind. In fact, they're in your head, even if you don't speak them. When it's dark, immediately you think dark. The word dark is in your mind. But that's when it, that depends upon your language that you know to begin with, right? So, the images that you see correspond to the words, and this is what we learn to be the world around us. Our perception of everything around us has to do with images and sounds that we produce to mark those images. Now, you learn these things when you are a child, of course, and as I say in my book here in continuation, we see at first a wall and a floor and perhaps a toy, but the images are specific to our culture in which we were born, right? Even if you speak the same language, there's another element of complexity about us that wall, for instance, here we see a wall. This wall is cold to the touch and it is made of masonry, so solid. Behind this is solid brick and this is a topping of, um, you know, they put the surface on there and they smooth it out and then they paint it. Well, that's a wall. but. In my home country, this wall is not quite the same unless you're in an industrial type building. My home country, you knock on the wall and it's hollow because we make our walls out of gypsum board. So even then, there's a difference. But a wall looks the same and you can say wall when you see it. That's easy. Toy also. Pen. Uh, objects like a glass. If I look at this glass, I would say this is a glass. Easy enough. Now, you don't think about the fact that you learn these things. You don't think about learning the word I. You don't remember when you learned the word nose. Because it was probably when your mother was touching her nose and touching your nose and saying nose, nose, but she made a sound with her mouth and pointed at an object so that the sound and the object were connected, nose. Eyes. You remember? T maybe you taught your children, or if you're if you've already had kids, you know you did this, and but you won't remember learning these lessons. But you did. Ear. See daddy's ear. See baby's ear. We teach them, and they learn how to say it. But these are deep, 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 deep in our psyche. This is deep in our minds. We don't always know. We know more complicated words, and when we learn them exsanguinate, you know, to drain the blood out of someone. That's not a word you learn when you're a child. So you remember, oh, I remember, I learned that when I was watching a, a crime investigation movie and they said that the body was exsanguinated. Then I had, what does that mean? And then I, I had to look it up and learned it. But all these other words, you don't remember learning them. They're just who you are. They're your identity. They are what they are. Images, and vocalizations together that make up the mosaic of your stability as a human being. That's your existence. Now, now we're getting around to understand what culture shock is. Once we learn these basic patterns of imaginary 
uh, or imagery and vocalizations, we take no thought of the fact that we indeed learn these things. It's simply our reality. When we go to another land with a different culture, suddenly the sensory input drastically changes and no longer matches the corresponding words in our brains. So in other words, the first level of it is when no longer, you, you may still only be speaking your language, mine being English, but you're in a village and the wall is made of palm throngs. In other words, there's the strips of a palm leaf in, weaved in between bamboo poles and it's very fragile. And so it's just a shell because it's a village. Well, that's a wall, but it doesn't really look like a wall to you. It doesn't quite even fit the word wall. It's more like a fence, but it's inside a house. Wow, isn't that quaint? And it's cute. It's different. And you sit on sliced bamboo panels on a floor. And I'm talking about a long house, for instance, here in Indonesia or Malaysia. So it's an elevated house made of these sticks. And you walk in there and it crunches when you're walking on it. And, and it's a house, but not at all like anything you've experienced. You never grew up with that. And so that wall is different. That floor is different. Now you're, the smells, are di everything's different. And, and your brain is being challenged about what is reality. You understand? It's very difficult at first. And so we start to amend the mental encyclopedia. In other words, when we see this is a different kind of wall, we relearn and add this image to the category of wall, but not quite. It's a subheading of wall, third world country wall, floor, Indonesian floor, etc. And a few times things a day are, okay, that's great. But, but after a while, um, it gets more and more difficult because you're, as you're amending it, soon the process becomes too difficult for our minds to handle at a certain pace. And there's an emotional and mental breakdown that we refer to as culture shock. You understand? In other words, first you don't realize it. And I tell you what, you've never had to deal with culture shock usually. You've only thought it was a, a form of homesickness because most of us just end up going on holiday or on a vacation to a, a different place. And when we go to that foreign place, and you can experience this in your own country, just going to a different city. I can leave New Orleans in the United States of America and go visit New York and be really challenged about what is and isn't, what's so different there. But it's still very, very similar. So I'm okay, but if I go down to Mexico on a, on a trip to Cancun or somewhere, then it's drastically different. But thank God I'm only there for four or five days. And at the end of those days, whew, I'm so happy to get home. When I'm home, it's that deep, <sighs> okay, now I'm back to reality. We will feel that relief because our brains suddenly relax because everything there we already know. But when we're in that other land, we didn't know those things. And the floor was not the floor and the wall is not the wall. And, it, you know, five or six days, it's just fun. But all you know is that you were stressed a little toward the end and you were getting what you call homesick, right? Yeah, I can't wait to get back to my own bed. Why? Because your own bed is your reality. And this other bed that you've been staying in, in this missions house or in this other place in the world is not your bed. It doesn't smell the same. It doesn't feel the same. The firmness is different. The pillows are not the same. And for a while you can handle it and just get a little backache from that bed. But after five or six days, it starts to wear on you. But before you can really go through a breakdown, you leave and you go home. And so you really don't quite reach what we call culture shock. Culture shock is, is, is a very negative reaction of your system shutting everything down because it cannot handle it. It's actually just like another form of nervous breakdown. And I want to give it to you in detail and I'm going to share some stories with you too about 
people I've seen and my, when I've been in culture shock and what it felt like and how to deal with it. But as I say, if you're visiting, it's one thing. Usually doesn't happen until you are 21 days. Anything past three weeks and everything changes. It takes three weeks to form a habit. It takes three weeks for it to move into normality. And that's when culture shock will appear. If you've never been on a missions trip past three weeks and you've only gone the visit, then you really have never had to contend with it. But when I get back from the break, I'm going to give you a lot more details about what it's like when you go into real culture shock.